Good morning, everyone. Just want to welcome you here. We've had a very busy week of ministry out in Andover. We've been up to London. Been over to Char- Carlton Park, Charlton Park, with the kids, and we've had a really good time of ministry. So we've kind of gone out early and come back late, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning. We're going to sing together. Once you stand up, we're going to sing together, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
hanging in here this morning. Maybe you're feeling guilty about something you've done this week. Well, all you have to do is confess that because the guilt was laid on his shoulders. And there's forgiveness there and grace. And uh, just confess your sin and he'll take it upon himself. Let's sing together, Christ is mine forevermore. And then we'll have the kids talk.
You know, we're saved by the gospel at a point in time in history when we believe. But we keep on being saved by that same gospel as Christ sanctifies us. And we will be saved by that same gospel when we're glorified one day. So the gospel brings us all the way to glory. That is such encouraging truth. This week we've been out preaching the gospel. One of the ways that we share with people is we use object lessons to gain their attention. And then we preach the gospel. So I'm going to ask Brady to come up here. And he's going to illustrate this illustration that we use most of the time with children. But uh, go ahead, Brady. if you sin some more like you know you fall 
Well, if you confess your sin, right, it'll keep cleansing you, right? From If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, yeah, very good. Thanks, Brady. All right. All right, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing. There is a fountain filled with blood. And the kids can be dismissed at this time. mother my dear mother passed away this this past April 
And she sang God's power to save until the end. In fact, it, it came to a point where I was telling her, do your therapy. We, we want you here in this world. We, we need you. And she said, I'm ready to go be with the Lord. And, and she passed out of this world, and she now knows more about the Lord than any of us sitting here because her faith was made sight. And she was a witness to me from the beginning when I was lost and in the darkness. And I got in her car one day, and she was listening to praise music. And I said, what is that horrible music? And I didn't like it because it was giving praise to God. It was giving praise to God. And she said, well, I'm praising Jesus. He's changed my life. And I watched my mom. She, she struggled with panic attacks in her life and anxiety. But she put her faith in Christ. And God was with her all the way from the beginning, all the way to glory. And uh, at her funeral, I, I got to preach there and say, you know, we don't sorrow like the world who has no hope. We sorrow, but not like the world who has no hope because her faith has been made sight. It just made me think of that as we sang this morning. I want to pray this morning, and uh, I'm going to do it a little different than you usually do it, and that's okay, I think. Uh, I'm going to base my prayer this morning on our prayer, our opening prayer on Psalm chapter 1, and uh, we're going to pray for some other things in there before we have our message today. So let's go ahead. If you want to read along Psalm 1, um, I'm not going to pray it exactly according to the words, but um, you can do that. So let's pray. Lord, your word says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. Lord, I pray that this would be true for us. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, that we wouldn't stand in the way of sinners, that we wouldn't sit with scoffers, Lord, but that our delight would be in you, and that, Lord, we'd rise up in the morning and meditate on your word on your truth, that we might know you more. Lord, uh, we lift up prayers today for those that sent us here in Virginia, Grace Bible Church, Pastor Rick Zaman and, and Stephen Boom, and all the saints there. We pray that you would be with them as they preach later this morning and uh, as they exhort your saints, Lord. We pray for every evangelical, God-fearing, Bible-teaching church here in Andover, Lord, this morning. We pray that you would be with their pastors and their teachers, that they might instruct your people, that they might be transformed by the hearing of your word. And then we pray that for our own congregation here, Lord. We pray that we would be transformed by the hearing of of your word, Lord. And we'd walk out of here more close to you, Lord. Lord, uh, we pray for the fruit, for the gospel witness that's been going on the past two weeks here in Andover and beyond. We pray for those that have heard the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that they wouldn't be able to get away from your word, that you would bring wandering sheep home that have been encouraged, and that those that are lost would be found, and that you would add to your church, Lord, those that are being saved right here in Andover, Lord. We know there's more that are called by your name here and that will be called by your name, and we just pray that you would grant repentance and faith. Lord, we pray for this church body, we pray that you would add to its number gifted people, Lord, to build up the body of Christ. 
that would be able to instruct and, and, and oversee the flock of God so that we can be mature and complete in you, Lord. We pray for growth in our individual lives, Lord. We pray that we would see our sin, that we would repent of our sin, and that we would grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for this message this morning, uh, that you'll speak to our hearts through your word, that we would be encouraged by the life of Paul and Timothy. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to... I'm going to be going through the book of 1 Timothy while I'm here. And so, today I'm going to give an introduction to the book, and we'll look at the first two verses. Very excited to go through this epistle because it talks about how the church should be run, the life of the church, and everyone's part in the church. And as we go through this series, I want you, maybe you could take notes. It's a biblical thing to learn and be instructed. And think about your part in this body, how you are currently taking part in this body, because many of you, I, I'm sure you do, but maybe how you could be a greater part of serving in this body. Every joint, every ligament is important, and so I want you to be praying about that as we go through the book these next six months. So 1 Timothy is near the end of Paul's ministry. There's one more book he writes after that. It is written between A.D. 62 and 64 after Paul's release from his first imprisonment. You see him praying in Philippians about that. And shortly he's, he's released from prison. He's imprisoned again between A.D. 66 and 67 from where he writes 2 Timothy, shortly before his martyrdom by the sword during the reign of Nero. His recipient, of course, is, is Timothy, his young protege, who is pastoring the church in Ephesus. If you think about Ephesus, it had a lot of good pastors. It had Paul, it had Timothy, and then after Timothy, it had the Apostle John towards the end of his life. What is the purpose of 1 Timothy? Well, that's found in 1 Timothy 3.14-16, through 16, and it ends in a psalm of praise. Uh, Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God. And that's what we want to learn, right? How to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Do you know the word church is made up of two words. One word means to call, one word means to call, and one word means out of. And so we're the called out ones. We are called out of this world into the church of the living God, into the assembly of the living God. I mean, that is a glorious truth that God chose each one of you here who is elect to be part of the church of the living God. A pillar and buttress of the truth. That's where you find truth. You find it from the, God's word proclaimed by the people of God who are the pillar and the buttress of the truth. And then he ends this, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up to glory. And so he, was, he manifested that which was hidden, all the promises of the Old Testament, realized in the New Testament, Jesus 
fulfilled all those things. And he proclaimed his message among the nation, and it was believed on in the world, and then he was taken up to glory, which, by the way, is our same path. It says that in Hebrews 2, that he leads many sons to glory. And so as we go through this pilgrim journey, it's, it cannot be reversed. We're headed to glory. Well, the gospel is in 1 Timothy. That was it in a nutshell. It's also in 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And so Jesus is our only way back to the Father. We were kicked out of the presence of God in the garden. And in Adam, we all die. But Jesus, He broke the power of sin and death, and He brings us back to the very presence of God. And now we live out our lives looking for that day when He'll transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious bodies. That place where we struggle with sin is in our bodies, our flesh, right? One day, there'll be no more struggle in sin because He's going to transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body. The Gospel is such good news. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. That's the good news of the Gospel. It's not really the streets of gold, although it includes that. You know, the pearly gates and all those things that are going to be in heaven. It's that we've been brought to God Himself. We were separated from God and were brought to God. How? He was put to death in the flesh, but He was made alive in the Spirit. And so the Gospel brings us back to God. Ephesians 2 says we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. But one day, He's coming back and He's coming to earth. And we will reign with Him. Alright. Chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. Paul is going to encourage Timothy to make his stand against false teachers. So we're going to learn about that. He's going to talk about the proper use of the law because these false teachers were twisting the law and so Paul's going to instruct Timothy on the proper use of the law. By the way, we use that when we evangelize, the proper use of the law because the law shows people their need for Christ. So every mouth will be stopped and the whole world made guilty before God. We'll expound on that later. Chapter 2, prayer and practice in the church. We pray for salvation for everyone, including the salvation of our leaders. We pray for them even if we don't like them. We pray for them in chapter 2. All right, chapter 3, it was Timothy's job to appoint elders. How do I know that? Because Paul writes him about the qualification for elders. Everywhere Paul went, he placed elders in the church. Note that it says elders, not elder. That means it's not just one person that's an elder in the church. And I want to say this, that in a congregation this size, there has to be young men who would step up and be an elder, that would be qualified to be an elder. We're going to be praying about that, and I'm going to be encouraging you to aspire to eldership. It's not just Don. 
we need more elders. Here's my proof of this. Uh, Acts 14.23, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And then Titus, and Titus, Titus is told to appoint elders all over Crete. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is, else is above reproach, a husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to charge of debauchery or insubordination. I'm sure there's people like this in this congregation. And so, he gives us instructions on the qualification for elders because elders should be appointed in the church. The second part of, uh, second, of 1 Timothy 3, um, he talks about appointing deacons. So what is the difference between deacons and elders? Well, deacons, they, they minister more to physical needs. They, they minister more to administration. I think when they, they look for men full of faith and the Holy Spirit to wait on tables, that these guys were deacons in a way. They were serving the, the widows. They were serving the body of Christ. And so that is the work of a deacon. Some of those guys, by the way, as they grew in their faith, they became evangelists. And you see them out in the book of Acts preaching the gospel and Stephen even being martyred. And I believe Philip was one of them too. And so they, they meet the physical needs and their administrative people in the body of Christ. And then elders, they have oversight over the body of Christ, and they have the tasks of preaching and teaching and leading, leading in prayer, and all these kinds of things. Isaac Adams put it this way, Deacons aid in the unity of the church by attending to the physical administrative matters while the elders are focused on oversight over the entire congregation through their work of teaching, praying, shepherding, and leading. And so, there are in this congregation both elders and deacons. Now, you may not have been recognized that as a deacon, but you may be already be doing deacon's work. And some of you may already be doing elder's work. That should come to the surface. We should be able to see that and say, hey, this person is acting like an elder. We should be talking to this person about eldership. So, that's why I want you to be praying about this as we go through this book. All right, chapter 4, Paul addresses false teaching again. This is the second time. Since the church's inception, there has always been false teachers. I mean, the apostles were dealing with false teachers. And so, if they were dealing with false teachers, how much more would we be dealing with false teachers in the 21st century? I ran into a false teacher in London just this past week. He, he wanted to prophesy over me, and, and he's telling me things like, you know, um, I see you're very precise, and, and, and he's like, he's moving around like this, and he's, he's, uh, he's saying, I, I think you're artistic. I got a sketchboard back there. Um, I think that you, you disciple people. I have like all these youth with me. You disciple young people like it's a real prophecy. And then I found out he was part of Bill Johnson's movement over in the United States of America. And they believe they can teach people. They have a school to teach people how to do signs and wonders. You can't teach people how to do those kinds of things. Those are gifts from God. And so we're always dealing with false teachers. No wonder Jude says in uh, verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that is once delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed 
who long ago were destined for condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. So oftentimes we think about it, oh, the battle is out there outside the walls of the church. Well, you know, the, the world is lost. They're going to act like the world. And yes, we go out, we put on the armor of God, and we are going out into a battle in a sense. But the battle is not only out there, it's very much within the walls of the church. And very oftentimes, these false teachers, they creep in to the church. And so we have to be alert. We have to have people with gifts of discernment. Because sometimes other people don't see it when these kinds of things are happening. Also in uh, chapter 4, he exhorts, he ex there's an exhortation to godly living and biblical teaching. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. This same guy in London and his, and his wife, they were like, you know what, you're too much into the Word of God. You know, you should base um, something on experience. And, and I, of course, said to him, well, I believe in ex experience, but my experience has to be grounded in the truth of God's Word, right? It can't be disconnected from the truth of God's Word. So instruction is very important. A lot of times people say, oh, you're making a sermon sound like you know, you're in school or something. Well, we're supposed to train ourselves in righteousness. We're supposed to learn the Word of God. We're supposed to know what books of the Bible mean. We, sh we should be able to say, if someone says to us, hey, what is the book of Ephesians about? We should be able to tell them, in a nutshell, what the book of Ephesians is about. Right now, you're learning about 1 Corinthians. By the end of this series, if you haven't already studied it for yourselves, you should be able to tell people what the book of 1 Corinthians is about. Right? And so it's very important that we study to show ourselves approved, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're told to do that. Over and over again, you see in Scripture, King David, Lord, write Your Word on the tablets of my heart. You see? We need to know God's Word. Alright, then chapter 5 through 6-2. I don't know who made this chapter break. He probably was riding his horse and maybe hit a bump. But uh, chapter 5 through 6-2 is instruction on older and younger men, older women and younger women, on widows, on elders, and on servants and masters. And so those are very much relational instruction of how each one of these people are to conduct themselves in the house of God. Okay. All right, chapter 6. False teachers again. False teachers again. So, I mean, this is near the end of Paul's ministry, and he's so contending, and Timothy now is contending with these false teachers. This brings us to the two verses we're going to do today. 1 Timothy 1. 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope. Note that there is a note of apostolic authority that is struck at the very beginning. And that is because of these false teachers that have crept in. And so he starts off with this note of apostolic authority. He says it's by the command of of God. And he also says that in Titus, those two books, he intimates that it's by the command of God. 
Note that he says, God, our Savior. That's from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. God has been our Savior. So, Paul's apostolic authority is grounded in God our Savior, but also in Jesus Christ, our hope. Jesus Christ, our hope. No doubt Paul has in mind his dramatic experience on the Damascus Road when he received his call. He talks about it in Galatians, beginning to read chapter 1, verse 15. But when he had set me apart before I was born, note that was before he was born, and who called me by his grace at a point in time in history, he believed, he heard the gospel directly from Jesus, and he believed at a point in time in history, was pleased to reveal the Son of God to me in order that I might preach, preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. So in other words, Paul's calling wasn't from anybody else but God himself. He was set apart for the gospel of God before he was even before he was even born. You know, that reminds me of what Paul says about all of us. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And he is the firstborn of many brethren. And those he predestined, these he also called. At a point in time in history, he predestined us from eternity past, and in a point in time in history, we heard the gospel and we believed it at God's appointed time. Those he called, he also justified. He declared us righteous before the eyes of God. Even though we're working out our salvation in fear and trembling as we walk through this life, he's justified us. He sees the end of our salvation. And those he justified, he even, these he also glorified. I taught very much on this last time I was here. It's called the golden chain of redemption. Our salvation starts in eternity past, and it brings us all the way to glory, including the apostle here, the apostle Paul, who was called in the same way, except he saw Christ himself. We didn't see Christ himself. We're not apostles. And so... He ordained him for his own purpose and glory to preach the gospel among the Gentiles. Here's Paul testifying again. This is before King Agrippa. And so he uses his testimony, I believe it's three or four times in the book of Acts when he's sharing the gospel. He uses his testimony as a springboard into the gospel and uh, Think about that. When you're sharing the gospel, no one can argue with your testimony. Your encounter with Christ in the scriptures, it's a very good starting point to share the gospel with people. I oftentimes do that myself. Here he is right here. Uh, uh, Acts 26, beginning to read at verse 15. And I said, who are you, Lord? After he's been knocked to the ground off his horse. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen from me, and to the things which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles, and here's his calling, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, and they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that's Paul's calling. You know what? We all have the same calling to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything 
I have commanded you. Through the gospel, they will be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to life. We have the same calling in a way, although we're not apostles. We're the people of God. Oftentimes, just as a side note, I've had to use this testimony of Paul with Muslims. And that's because Muslims reject the authority of the Apostle Paul. And so, oftentimes I have to share with them, you know that the Apostle Paul was called by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was out persecuting and and killing Christians, and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus and called him and set him apart for his own purposes. And so we have to accept the authority of the Apostle Paul as an apostle. They don't want to accept that because it will blow up Islam if they accept the, the authority and the apostolic call of the Apostle Paul. So, Timothy now is the recipient. We're going to come to the second verse. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how did this all come about? Well, we read in Acts 16, beginning to read at verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman, who was a believer, but his father was Greek, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they knew that his father was a Greek. Here you see, here you see a man that Paul is looking at that could be an elder in the church. You know, he's been observed by other people, and they say this, you know, he knows the scriptures, he's faithful to the scriptures, and so Paul, he wants to take Timothy with him to train him more. Note that his training for being a a pastor, which he's going to become, doesn't start in the four walls of the church. Just a note there. Um, But it starts actually going out into the highways and into the byways to plant churches and preach the gospel, evangelize. And so he goes with him and he sees how Paul ministers, and he becomes his disciple. So we see in that text that Timothy was from Lystra, which is in Turkey. It's a a region around Galatia. We also see that Paul heard about him from the brothers, and so that's why they took him. Why did Timothy know all these things? Well, he was trained up in his own household. And many of you... You seek to train up your children in your own household, and that's exactly what Timothy did, 2 Timothy 1.5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. And then also 2 Timothy 3.14-15, through 15, thus we see, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, yeah, that's right. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so his parents, his mother, and his grandmother discipled Timothy. Maybe you're a mother or a grandmother in this room. You have a very great call in the body of Christ to disciple your children and your grandchildren. Who knows? They may grow up and what they might do 
in the body of Christ. And so, note that it's the Scripture that makes Timothy wise to salvation. Again, we need to be grounded in the Word of God. It is so very important. I cannot emphasize this more. It would be lovely to see people with pens taking notes and saying, how can I apply? My daughter, she grew up taking notes. And she still does that to this day for every sermon that she hears. My son grew up and he takes notes. He can look back and say, so-and-so preached this day. This is what they said on that day. And it helps you remember what you're learning. This taking, this taking Timothy with Paul, who was that modeled by first? Who modeled that in the first place? Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He said, follow me, leave the dead to bury the dead. And he said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me, is not worthy of the kingdom. So discipleship is a call to follow Jesus first, and then others that are following Him likewise, who are more mature in the faith. Paul put it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. He had that caveat, as I follow Christ, because we're not perfect like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Timothy he was struggling in his leadership in the church. And the great apostle was encouraging his student. You know, tradition says that Timothy, he died well. He died well. He listened to his teacher. Here's what's recorded of Timothy in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Timothy was a celebrated disciple of St. Paul and bishop of Ephesus where he zealously governed the church until A.D. 97. At this period, as the pagans were about to celebrate the feast called Katagogion, Timothy, meeting the procession, severely reproved them for their ridiculous idolatry, which so exasperated the people that they fell on him with clubs and beat him in such a dreadful manner that he expired of the bruises two days later. I can imagine that Timothy was out there preaching the gospel and they, and, and, and they put him to death for his faith. Paul went by the sword, Timothy beaten by clubs. Do you ever consider that your faith might cost you your life? I mean, 10 years ago, that might have been unthinkable. But look at the climate of the West. It is becoming more and more and more intolerant. I know I said this last Sunday night, but there's different people here Sunday morning. You will be persecuted for your faith. You will be. If you hold the biblical marriage, biblical gender, you will be persecuted. Are you ready to stand the onslaught of that? Because it is coming, and it is coming very, very quickly. I'm on the front lines. They push over my sketchboard on college campuses. They break my sketchboard. Many times I'm thinking I'm going to get punched when I'm out there preaching the gospel. Because every time I preach, what about gender, genders? What about homosexuality? They ask me all the time. You give a biblical answer, you're going to expect that people are going to be unhappy with you. And I always just try to turn it to the gospel as soon as possible. But one time I said to the students, I said, you know, I didn't come here to talk about that. You know what they said to me? They said, why not? You're on a college campus. You better be ready to talk about this. And I went home and I thought, you know what? They're right. 
I have to give a biblical answer to what is keeping them separated. The sin, it's a besetting sin, keeping them separated from God. So, what is our application this morning? Well, I have an application for those who have not yet believed. Turn to God, our Savior, and Jesus, our only hope. Again, it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He came and He gave His life a ransom for you and for me. And if you'll turn away from your own sin today and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. It'll be just like you never sinned. He who has the Son of God has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. But the wrath of God abides on that person. Jesus satisfied the just wrath of God And anyone who would turn and put their faith in Him is safe, is forgiven, is headed for glory. And so if that's you this morning, turn to the Lord while He may be found. Because He's quick. He's full of loving kindness. And He's quick to forgive. Alright, application for believers. Well, I already suggested you should take notes. I have it written down here. Um, you know, I'll give you another verse for that. Joshua 1.8 This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good excess, success. So I encourage you, even if you go on vacation, or you're sick, I encourage you to turn on Don's sermons, and to turn on the sermons I'll be preaching and the other guys that will be preaching so that you understand these books in totality. I encourage you to do that. Be students of the Word. Here's another one. What what has He called you to do in the church? He hasn't called you just to occupy a seat every week. That's what you do when you go to football games. And even there, you're enthusiastic when you're cheering for your team. You need to be a part. He has called you to exercise your gifts and talents in the church. And that is why we believe in church membership at Koinonia. Maybe maybe you would say to me, well, I can't find it in the Bible chapter and verse. Well, what is wrong with committing publicly to a body that you're a part of. Why why are you afraid to commit to a body that you're a part of? Yeah, maybe it's not chapter and verse, but you ought to commit to the people of God here and say, I want to take part in serving the family of God. That's all I have for this message. I thank you very much this morning for coming, and let's go ahead. We're going to we're going to close in song, and, and then I'm going to pray. The Ancient of Days. Let's sing to the Ancient of Days who condescended and came down to earth to ransom us from our sins and to bring us back to glory, back to God. So let's go ahead and stand up and sing. This morning, enthusiastically, sing. Um.
pray and meditate for a few minutes. And then in a few minutes, I'll close us in prayer. Ancient of days, what a blessing it is that you called us out of this dark world into the household of God to serve you and to serve your people. I pray, Lord, as we encounter you in our lives, in your word, and and in the highways and in the byways, at our workplaces and schools, Lord, that we would be your, your kingdom ambassadors, your servants, and that we'd always be able to come back to the house of God, the pillar and buttress of the truth, to be strengthened and encouraged by people with a multiplicity of gifts and talents. Fill us with your power, Lord, and your grace, that we might serve you and one another, and that we might be lights in the world, holding out the word of truth. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.